In this video, I encounter someone's old homework, archive Apple II discs, and get confronted with the internals of a floppy disk, among other things. Hello and welcome to episode 3 of Adventures in Archiving. In this series I show you how to archive old software in an amateur way. In this episode we'll tackle archiving my humble, some might say very small, collection of Apple II discs. I found these about a year ago on the Dutch version of eBay. They came with some other Apple items, an Apple cable, a scribe printer color ribbon in nice old Apple packaging and some generic looking printer ribbons that to some might even look like a rare vintage audio format. Of course, there are also the two disc boxes and two manuals. I'll be sure to archive the manuals later, although they are probably already online. Interestingly, when I was cutting off the address label of the box, I noticed the seller had used some old paper with text on it, related to AI, McKinsey and other strange stuff, almost sort of like a report or homework. Here are the discs. In the first box we find the following discs. Most of them labeled. This one says comp, spell, meaning game in Dutch, Apple Panic, nice, 301287, ah, December of 1987. This disc says swashbuckler. Makes me wonder if this person got these discs for Christmas. I know that was a thing back in the day. I like that they wrote the copyright date on a clearly illegal copy. This box appears to have belonged to a 3M diskette clock. Neat. More discs, starting with a DOS version 3.3 disc, and a bunch of unnamed discs, and KiCat. Okay, I got out my trusty Apple IIe. By the way, I'm assuming the Apple II, specifically the Model E, doesn't need an introduction, but this is a computer made by Apple in 1983. It runs on a lovely 6502 CPU at about 1 MHz. It took me a long time to find this one. I should really clean the case, it doesn't look dirty from afar, but up close you can see some grime. The Apple II is connected to my computer monitor 80, which I got for 5 bucks from someone in town. Nice little monitor, and connected to the computer I have this Distar floppy drive. I stumbled upon it by accident on the Dutch version of eBay, like most stuff I have in my collection. I have to say it was really well packed by the seller. The seller didn't specify anything about the drive, only that it was untested. There was no reference to the Apple II, but I recognized the connector. That brings me to a Retromel's DVOET. DVOET, you might be wondering? Well, that stands for Dutch version of eBay theory, not limited to the Dutch version, of course. When I looked at other listings by the seller, I saw an Apple II hiding in the background. I had some screen recordings of this, but I lost those in my ginormous collection of, of uninteresting pictures and videos. This made me wonder why the seller would list it as untested, since they clearly had the equipment to test it. Listing it as working and tested might increase the price. So my theory was that it was probably broken, and listing it as untested would bring in a bit more cash. This theory probably says more about my way of thinking than the sellers, by the way. When I connected the disk drive to my Apple II controller card and cleaned the drive heads with one of my cleaning disks, I put this alcohol in a spray bottle to prevent a big mess. Let's clean the heads. Ah, good. The drive powers on when I turn on the Apple II. I put in one of the discs and, well, look at that. It works. Nice. I like the small form factor of this drive. Thinking about my theory, I could almost suggest that listing an item as broken these days brings in more money as people find it fun to fix old electronics. But that's just an unrelated side tangent. So let's move ahead with our discs and see if they work with the Apple II. The first disc I'm testing is the one I already tested the drive with. It contains a copy program and makes a horror movie like sound. I like that it says call Pirates Funhouse and then has a phone number. Next, the KiCad discs. A menu. When I select KiCad, we see a loading bar, but nothing happens. Probably a corrupted program or a corrupted disk. My ZV-1 is having some focus issues again. Well, don't we all suffer from focus issues from time to time? DOS version 3.3. Loading basic into the language card, nice. Although I believe we don't have a language card inside this Apple II. A list of programs. You can see a bit of an issue with the screen here. More on that in a minute. Oh, and KiCad is also on this disc. Should have tried it. Kind of want to know what it is. Let's try this color demo program. A color demo on a monochrome screen is always nice. 
This is the Image Writer Toolkit. Like option 5. <laughs> Download. Nice. This is the Apple Panic Disc. A nice game. Very nostalgic. Took some time and practice to get the hang of it. This Razer game too. Very difficult. Shows my bad driving skills very well. This game clearly shows that the CRT was having some issues in the middle. At first I feared there was something wrong with the tube, but after fiddling some more with the back controls, it was mostly removed. Also this game clearly showed off my lack of reading instructions as I was smashing into the keyboard to find the right key. I missed that it says on the screen to press the escape key. So let's start with the archiving. As it appears most discs want to load on my actual Apple II. For most of my archiving I use this black 5 and a quarter inch drive that is permanently on my desk. It is an Epson SD621L, made in Japan. I connect the drive to my computer using this very nifty device, the Grease Weasel. It's a bit dusty. To power my drive I used to use a computer power supply, but those tend to be noisy and take up space. So now I use this generic power supply with the right connector. So we are going to use the Grease Weasel to archive the disks. The Grease Weasel can be operated via a command prompt program. And also a GUI, but I prefer the command prompt program. Although if you are not familiar with that it might seem a bit daunting, as it did to me. The GW.X program provided by the Grease Weasel folks doesn't seem compatible with Apple II discs. Correct me if I'm wrong here. So to fix that we will use the Flux Engine software. Which looks and operates very similarly to the Grease Weasel one. Only using different commands. The Flux Engine's job is to read magnetic data called Flux of a disc, decode it and create an image. This also works the other way around, where the Flux Engine writes to a disc. Before we start I always clean my drive with some alcohol. For this I use the Grease Weasel program as it has a special command for cleaning the drive that moves the head up and down. This cleaning disc has already proven to be a lifesaver multiple times. I had discs not reading on the first attempt but being readable after using the cleaning disc. Ok, here's the Flux Engine software. Just a quick disclaimer, I am a retro amateur and in no way a floppy disk expert. So some of the things I do might be very stupid or impractical. Advice is always welcome. Here are the commands we will be using to archive the disks. Let's try to dissect it a bit. Flux Engine Read is of course the read command. Apple II is the format. 140 is the tracks. S Drive 0 is the source drive number. And O Apple II.img is the output file name and type. Let's put a disk in the drive and run the command. The flux engine starts doing its work. And after a couple of seconds the disk is read and the image created. Simply press the arrow up key to show the command again. Change the file name and continue with the next disk. By the way, the original screen captures are very slow. I was capturing in 4K and it turns out my Windows 10 Intel Nuke was not really up to the task. Time to upgrade to Windows 11 I guess. Because there were a bunch of disks that didn't come with a label to tell us what is on them, I decided to start numbering the disks to keep the archiving a bit more organized. For instance, this is disk 1 and so on. Continuing archiving. I redid the recording, bad quality too, to show how fast a disk is archived. I would say it's pretty fast, it handles the disks. Interesting to see some bad sectors on this disc as you can clearly see some damage. This disc was also interesting as the disc shell was open and you could see the whole magnetic disc. So I wanted to see what would happen if I placed it back in. Seems to stay together, let's put it in the drive and see. Well, it 
streets. Let's test some of the images we created. The swashbuckler image works. In a minute, more on how to get your images to work with this emulator. Nice game, very simple, but a bit repetitive after a few minutes of play. This is a clock related program, a program with graphic demos, a nice circle. Then I need some Apple II expert to explain to me what this is. Unnamed Disk 19 contains these machine language lines that don't seem to do anything. When I look at the Disk Insider Press, a very nice program that allows you to take a close look at the files on your Apple II disks, I could see that it seemed to hold a sort of database program. I can also see a hello file, which I believe is a sort of start menu that allows you to select programs. Since we are Insider Press, I'll show you how I make the images work with AppleWin. If you go up here to the symbol with the two floppy disks and select one of your IMG files, this list will pop up with all the different formats that you can convert the image to, like .do or .2mg for AppleWin. Then you create a new file name and the image is converted. Very simple and works really well, making CiderPress a lovely program for Apple II preservation. I wish the disks were more common and easier to find out there. The image writer program was also correctly archived. While archiving, I remember that these disks were not my only Apple II disks. And while I doubt it, you might be among the 100 or so who saw my video where I talked about adding this Apple IIe to my collection. There I showed a very Dutch disk, this disk. All rise for the Dutch anthem. I remember thinking when I saw that being played how great it would be if I could archive that disc. Well, as you can imagine, I did also archive that disc. All rise for the archived Dutch anthem. With Apple Win, you can see the color version of this image. I really like the startup commercials of this program. So this is just a magazine on a disc and you can read the Dutch articles. More on that in a second. Oh, here's the color version. That brings me to the emulators I found that are compatible with the images I create. For Windows, I found Apple Win, which is a very versatile program and works great. For macOS, I found the program Virtual 2, which is also a very nice program with fun sound effects and stuff. This is a paid program, but it allows you to use the free version with a minute break every 10 minutes. That's not really a deal breaker for me. To make it work with the macOS emulator, I had to use CiderPress again to convert the images to a .do file type. This disk is a demo diskette for a program or developer called Frank and Britting. Interestingly, this is a disk that has a loose shell. I'm hopeful it will work for other programs. The demo appears to be in German and shows some prices in the old German currency Deutsche Mark. The macOS and Windows emulators are not the only type of emulator my amateur archive disks are compatible with. You can also use them with a disk drive emulator. The emulator I have, made by Big Mess of Wires, can use the files I made. So let's plug it into the Apple II. It would have been a little bit better if they had the ribbon cable point the other way. So here's the floppy MU. I put the two Dutch user group disks on the SD card and when I select the 2MG file and power cycle the Apple II, you can see that the disk loads perfectly. Same applies for the .do file type. There was one issue I did not yet manage to fix. To my surprise, when I looked on the back of some of the disks, I discovered they also have programs on the other side. The drive I use to archive my disk doesn't work with the normal commands when you flip the disk around. There's a workaround in the Grease Weasel software that I found useful for other formats that we will talk about in a future episode, but with the Flux Engine I'm not familiar with a command like that. Searching for one came up dry. Then I realized I could try something else to archive the b-sides of the disks. So when I take this disk, flip it over and then insert it into the drive, I can run a copy program on my Apple IIe and copy it to a blank disk 
which is the right side up. Then I can try to archive the newly copied disk in my drive connected to my computer. Duals 3.3 came with a copy program, but I spent an hour fiddling with it without success. I think I can make this work, but it will require some servicing of the drives, which I will save for part 2. To summarize this archival adventure, I managed to archive most of my discs, except the B-sides. That's a future project. You will be able to find all the discs over at my archive website. You will find some notes and links to emulators and explainer videos that show you how to use the files. The Amsterdam Apple User Group discs are on top. I would love to collect more of them. Speaking of the articles, I managed to translate disc 6 to English, so if you are interested in the articles, you, you can find them here. I wanted to make the translated articles work with the actual Apple II using Ciderpress, but that turned out to be a bit too complicated. The discs are numbered using the labels I created. For instance, disc 8 contains Swashbuckler. I'll make sure to add more info on each disc in the coming days. Well, that is it for now. As promised, there will be more on this Apple II. If you made it all the way here, Thanks for watching this archival adventure. Bye.